This is a uh, CSF culture on a 21-year-old male college student. Um, when this particular type of specimen comes to the microbiology laboratory, the first thing that's going to be done is a cytospun gram stain will be made. So looking at the gram stain, we can see that we have gram-negative cocci uh, in the direct smear. Um, so that being said, that's going to give us, I mean, of course, the direct smear always gives us, uh, I mean, it serves two functions. It uh, gives us, the tech at the bench, an idea of what's going to be growing on the plates, and it also gives the physician uh, information without having to wait a full 24 hours, for example, to see growth on the plates. All right, um, so from the pathogens, the common pathogens that we have for a spinal fluid, we have Streptococcus pneumoniae, Streptococcus agalactiae, Staphylococcus aureus, Neisseria meningitidis, Haemophilus influenza, um, E. coli, and Listeria monocytogenes. Now in spinal fluid, uh, pathogens are broken down or can be, generalizations can be made about um, which age groups should have contain which pathogens. Uh, so for example, newborns tend to uh, have uh, Streptococcus agalactae or group B strep or uh, for example, E. coli or Listeria monocytogenes. Now, older uh, patients uh, tend to have other ones like Streptococcus pneumoniae, Neisseria meningitidis, Haemophilus influenza, and possibly Staph aureus. Um, so, you know, based on the gram stain that we saw, you know, directly made from the CSF, we have gram-negative diplococci, or sorry, gram-negative cocci, and from the um, pathogens, the common pathogens, remember this is just what I've listed are just common pathogens, not all pathogens that we could see uh, in a spinal fluid. Um, really, there's only one that fits that, that, fits that picture um, of gram-negative cocci, and that is Neisseria meningitidis. So let's go ahead and take a look at our plates and see what our plates have. Okay, so here's our chocolate plate, and as I require from my students, uh, they really need to know the function of each of the media that we set up on cultures what, and what organisms are going to grow on which plates. So let's take a look here. And we just kind of have these kind of grayish, a little bit shiny uh, colonies growing. And this is after 48 hours. And this would have been in an increased CO2 incubator. Okay, and now here's our just our routine 5% sheep blood auger. And again, we have what looked to be, I'm quite certain that those are the same culture, the same bacteria that were on the chocolate plate. Okay, and then let's go ahead and take a look at our McConkies. All right, so our McConkies has absolutely no growth on it. So that allows us to rule out E. coli or any member, basically, of Enterobacteriaceae or Pseudomonas. So let's go back and take a look at the chocolate here in the sheep blood. Uh, now, certain organisms will only grow on certain types of media. For example, Haemophilus influenza is a, what we call a fastidious organism, and it has uh, growth requirements or nutritive requirements. And that particular organism is only going to grow on chocolate. So just due to the fact that we have growth on both plates, well, we can probably eliminate that organism. Now, we from the list of pathogens that we had, um, you know, and based on the direct gram stain, it looks like it's Neisseria meningitidis, but we have to ask the question, does the growth pattern on uh, the plates match the pattern of the organism? So that is a yes. Now, uh, Neisseria meningitidis will grow both on chocolate and sheep blood. Generally, we consider Neisseria kind of fastidious, meaning that they need a little bit of extra support to get them to grow and thrive, but this particular organism will grow on both chocolate and sheep blood. So in all of these videos, I'm not going to talk really much about 
what we do when it comes to working up the organisms, but what is the first test that we always do uh, when we're working up um, a gram-negative caucus? Okay, now your instructor in this case may make you uh, do a gram stain of this organism, and if that's what your instructor tells you to do, that's what you do, and that's not a bad thing to do. But based on my experience and the gram stain of the specimen and the growth pattern on the plates, I'm going to move ahead, and the first test that we always do is the what? oxidase, right? So we expect Neisseria and Moraxella, which are gram-negative cocci, we expect them to be oxidase positive. So um, what are we going to send out for a preliminary report, right? Because we want to give the physician as much information as we can as quickly as possible. That was the function of the direct smear to give, the, you know, that was one of the functions was to give the physician uh, early information about what may be causing this patient to have meningitis. Now we have more information. We need to relay that to the uh, physician. So I, uh, with spinal fluid, spinal fluids and bloods, we generally tend not to quantitate. On other cultures like sputums or urine cultures, we're doing some kind of quantitation about the amount, but just simply because blood and spinal fluid are sterile body sites, just, be, just the fact that an organism is there is enough information. We don't need to say f few, rare, moderate, or many. So I'm going to say as a preliminary report, um, probable Neisseria species, identification, and susceptibility testing to follow.